Bulls competing for mates will often confront each other in sometimes violent and deadly fights. After witnessing the passion and the pain of moose courtship, you'll wonder how they ever succeed. Spring is when calves are born, and when moose again are most unpredictable. A cow might charge and kick you to death if you come too close to her or her calf. They can be just as aggressive toward their own offspring. Watch as this year old bull attempts to visit mom after the birth of her new twins. Moose attacks on people are extremely rare, but moose present a daily and deadly threat to both people and themselves in a different way. I was driving the girls' basketball team back from their game and I had no warning. He just came up out of a dip and uh, directly into our path. His shoulder hit where the mirror is and it propelled his body up onto the bus and his antlers cracked the windshield. Collisions between moose and vehicles are virtually a daily occurrence. On average, three people and 500 moose are killed every year in Maine alone. But when I jammed the brakes on, the front of the car went down sharp like that, and that's when we clipped him right at his ankle, so to speak. And he just come right through there, his forward shoulders hit the top of the windshield and drove the rear view mirror behind the front seat. If there'd been somebody sitting in the center of the car in the front seat, they probably would have been killed because the roof was driven right back. The next day I took him to the slaughterhouse and got him cut up. So I always say that uh, we grill that moose twice, once for the Cadillac and the other one on the grill. <laughs> to dramatize the problem, alligators, bears, and cougars don't kill nearly as many people as vehicle collisions with moose and deer. And because moose are much larger than deer, the collisions are more severe. So they are justifiably the deadliest animal in North America. Here's why. Moose walk and stand anywhere they want. And that includes right in the middle of a busy highway. As a vehicle approaches, a moose will just stand there. Or, as you see here, dart in front of you at any time. I've been out on so many that it's, it's hard to recall them all, you know what I mean? Three people were killed, all from different vehicles because of a moose. You know, the moose got hit by a vehicle. Somebody else didn't see the moose and they swerved to go out around it when it was laying in the road and the tractor trailer ran over the top of that car and ended up killing the person, then running up and running over another car that had pulled over to help and ended up killing a woman and her, I don't know, four or five month old boy, I guess. The problem is so bad that special warning signs have been put up and the number of hunting permits is increased where collisions with moose are worst. But many people believe moose are being unfairly punished. I've seen circumstances where I thought that they deliberately run the moose over just to have the moose. To me, they got just as much right to be out on the roads as we do. After all, it was their land before it was ours. 
the girls were a little uh, upset, but um, basically they were just concerned about the moose. They're really great animals. They're beautiful animals and they're, they just want to live here too. But there's really nothing you can do to uh, stop them from coming on the road, I don't believe. Traffic drives through the heart of the debate over whether animals have or should have social and legal rights. The moose's economic and spiritual relationship with people and special government protection indicates they already do. But not everyone thinks that's either right or good. A lot of junk science that's been running around uh, is to, as to what really goes on and what it's really like being here and what really goes on with the moose herd. We have enough of them around so that uh, we basically call them bog donkeys because they're sort of about as bright. A lot of them uh, have circling disease and uh, other problems, so uh, things are a little different than what the tourists see when they come up a little bit later on. But uh, they enjoy them, and uh, we enjoy having enough of them, but we don't need too many. I think they're pretty stupid. <laughs> when you spend enough time dodging them things on the road, coming back from fishing or something at night, and they're too numb to get in the woods, and they'll run for, for three miles down the road in front of you, no matter what you do, put your lights on, off, shutting off, you stop, and, uh, and they stop, and then you start up, and they start up. Yeah, they're, uh, they're bog donkeys, I'm sorry. At gathering places across Maine, people are vocal in their resentment of government, out-of-staters, large landowners, and developers dictating their future. 50 or 55 percent of those people don't hunt or anything like that, and they don't know anything about it. Right. What needs to be done is to have the, the, the hunting clubs like the Fin and Feather Club and stuff like that and in inland fisheries and game have more educational things. Many believe the state's lottery to award moose hunting permits is more proof of oppression. They think it favors out-of-staters because they bring in more money than Maine's own residents do. I'm 65 years old and I've had a hunting license a current hunting license for 55 years and I've put in every year and my wife has put in every year since uh, moose season started <laughs> and uh, we've never been drawn. We're just sitting here looking at the uh, beaver because we're going to be flying uh, in, in one probably shortly up in Canada where they have a lot less moves. <laughs> compared to what we now have in Maine. Is the relationship between Moose and the people of Maine working? Compare it to similar relationships elsewhere. Alligators, like Moose, were almost extinct. They've recovered, but are still listed as a threatened species. Bears are coming back, but that means some, like the grizzly bear, could lose their protection as an endangered species. Mountain lions and wolves are also rebounding, but now the threat to these predators is not hunting. Urban sprawl and poaching are the major threats to all these animals, including moose, as humans move deeper into their habitats. The problem is people. So we are also the solution. We want to be sure that that resource is protected and they're not threatened in any way uh, by space being violated. Anytime you're dealing with wildlife, uh, they need their space as you and I need ours. We're going to focus on managing people. Uh, the resource will manage itself very well if we don't get in its way. So our emphasis is to manage people, to in provide information education, which will help people understanding the do's and the don't, uh, don'ts when dealing with resource. This is kind of a, an interesting place because it, it shows clearly man's, how man does change his environment and how things, how as man does certain things, it changes, it changes the wildlife in different areas and primarily the biggest change in this area have been moose. Some say there are not enough moose. Some say too many. Here are the facts. The moose herd in Maine dropped from 40,000 to around 30,000 since hunting resumed. 
about 25 percent. The number of hunters who bag a moose has fallen from 96 to 80 percent. More hunters and tourists come from around the world but are seeing fewer moose. Still, the number of traffic accidents involving moose has not changed significantly, despite a costly safety campaign. Again, the problem appears to be people. People simply drive too fast many times. There are incidents where a moose will simply come up over the bank, grassed area onto the pavement, and have run into vehicles instead of the vehicle hitting them. This is my opinion speaking. The moose were here long before we were, and we've kind of invaded their property somewhat, so we have to uh, drive accordingly this time of year, especially after dark. You need to uh, really go below the speed limit. But besides the debate over traffic and the size of the herd, there are other possible reasons moose are not seen as often. First, as hunting and poaching continue, moose trust humans less. It was illegal to hunt them for nearly 50 years, so moose got used to us not shooting them. Now they may be learning to avoid us. Second, the struggling forest products industry. Less logging also means less new food for moose. Like any animal, they'll go where the food is. And moose can travel long distances in Maine. The thousands of miles of logging roads are like an interstate system. Moose don't have to cross a major road or a populated area where they can be easily seen. Combine all that with habitat destruction, what we call property development, and moose could be driven so far back into the woods they won't need or want to be seen. Lately, since they've been hunting the past few years, the moose, uh, they're not as easy to find. We don't have the number of moose in Baxter that we used to have. Fewer moose could have a big impact on Maine's economy. If you ask people why they came here, other than just to kind of generally relax in, in a kind of an inland environment without a lot of people around, uh, they want to see moose. That's why they come. Times could get even tougher for people like Dale Stevens, who's still recovering from the mill layoffs. As for hunting, its popularity is declining everywhere. There are plenty of other things to hunt and trap in Maine, but those animals are available elsewhere. Maine needs moose hunters, not just for their money, but to help manage the herd. The broader answer is that Maine without real, live moose just would not be Maine anymore. Before, after. As the cow moves, the calf follows the steps the same exact way as the cow does, you know. The cow takes a few steps, the calf does the same thing and stops when, when the cow stops. It's really fascinating. Like I say, they're such a special animal. They totally have my heart, and um, I don't think I've ever enjoyed myself more in my life um, than all the work that I've been doing with these animals. and the people of Maine live together is bigger than the North Woods, deeper than Moosehead Lake, taller than Mount Katahdin. It's a spiritual bond that defies religion, an economic bond that defies convention. It's a natural bond sealed in the undying love of a land that has survived ages of abuse and continues to endow its inhabitants with a bounty of our planet's riches. Essentially, this relationship is very human, after all the troubled history, the fighting and death, people and moose have decided that they either like living together or simply can't live without each other. My theory is there isn't uh, any such thing as too much fun and watching moose is fun. It's a joy and a privilege for me to, uh, to share what we have here with everyone around. Human beings have a great responsibility uh, because we're the animal endowed by our creator with the ability to understand what's going on and to decide what to do about it. We're the one animal that can, you know, exercise any kind of self-restraint. That ability to exercise self-restraint has been at the center of religious thinking for thousands of years, and now it needs very much to be at the center of, of practical thinking uh, as we deal with the environment. Our job 
in exercising this dominion, which is nothing more than a clear statement of the fact. Human beings are now the dominant force on this planet and affecting its natural systems. Uh, our responsibility in doing that becomes acute and the single most important part of exercising that responsibility, that dominion, is starting to take a big step back and take it soon so that we leave some room for the function of the natural world upon which we and all else depend. The world has changed dramatically since we were hairy beasts cowering in our caves. We now rule nature, but unlike nature, we haven't found the balance yet between what we want and what nature needs. What's happening in Maine is a vision of a sustainable future, a laboratory where we are learning self-restraint. We no longer decide who lives and dies to reinforce our power, but to maintain balance. We don't indiscriminately destroy land to satiate our vanity, but measure our invasions with the impact on wildlife and the environment we share with them. We see here something that can be done on the entire planet. But to sustain our species and everything else that now depends on us, we must not only exercise self-restraint, we must reach out and protect all living things like children who cannot talk, vote, or even get out of the way of a car. At the same time, we must treat them as fellow citizens who contribute to the common good and on whom we depend for our own survival. It sounds complicated, but it's not. It's a cornerstone of every religion and moral code that is too often forgotten. Respect all living things and their property, just like a neighbor.